Excellent. So uh, here we are. We are just uh, jumping in and uh, wanted to just first start by apologizing to our panelists with the um, kind of inadvertent uh, uh, messaging on the timing. So Karen, thanks for being here. We're going to start with some other updates. So it'll give us a chance to just make sure we're all fully assembled for the second part of our dialogue. So we're going to start with uh, just some overall special ed updates. That'll probably be about 10 minutes. And then we'll get to the um, the main topic for today that I'm so excited about, which is thinking about how we connect school health and special education through staffing solutions. And we have some amazing panelists to join us today and just talk about, you know, how are we supporting our school health services and what are we doing to build out a school health services team? Um, and you'll hear more about that as we go along this morning. Um, and, you know, really with this idea, of, you told us that you wanted more information about staffing solutions, that staffing is a big issue in our schools. And so we want to focus today on the kind of connection between school health and special education, um, because a lot of our students with disabilities rely on school health services in a variety of ways. And so what you're going to hear from the panelists today are creative ways in which they have worked to staff their, their programs so that they can meet the needs of their students. And I, I'm really looking forward to that panel discussion and I'm so grateful for our panelists for being here. So a few updates. I'm going to now turn uh, the microphone over to my very esteemed colleague, Jamie Camacho, uh, to just give us some updates on the grant application process. Thank you, Russell. So I think I mentioned last month that there's gonna be some changes with um, the federal grant application process and the new GEM system. So what I wanted to do today is give you a little bit of a checklist so that you could start preparing. Um, the applications will be open July 1st and there's some changes. So I just wanted you to have some information in advance so you can do some planning. Um, the first thing on the list is the conditions for um, of assistance. And I think, you know, last year we started every school district needs to do this annually. Um, we'll be sending out the new um, copy for FY24 um, very soon. You'll be getting that. Just a reminder that it does need to be submitted annually. So you, every single district needs to upload a new one and you're gonna actually upload it into the new GEM system. You won't have to email it into us. Everything will be part of the GEM system. Just a reminder that you need to have um, four signatories on, on this. So just for planning purposes. Um, the second piece um, is MOE. Just a reminder that you're gonna need to have your student data for the upcoming year for your projections. Um, that's nothing new. That's the same um, process as always, but I just a little bit of a reminder on that. Um, and um, cubed. So just a reminder for any district that received a letter from us in the fall um, that you are in uh, needing uh, intervention as far as the special ed determinations, uh, you will be responsible for um, setting aside at least 2% of your IDA funds for M cubed. So just again, another reminder as far as your planning um, before you actually get into the application process. And if you are an M cube district, another reminder that you need to make sure that you submit your end of the year reports. Um, Russell, we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, again, districts that receive um, letters from us in the fall um, that you identified for significant disproportionality, um, you'll be required to set aside your 15%, your mandatory 15% reserve. Um, and those districts that may want to opt in to CEIS, um, again, just want to make sure that you're planning ahead um, so that if you do want to um, take advantage of um, changes, flexibilities, I guess, with, with spending um, to CEIS, you may want to as well. Uh, on to equitable service. Jimmy, you're just breaking up a bit. Uh, let's see, is it, April, you're seeing that Jamie's broken up there? Yep, Rosie. I can jump in. Okay, thanks, April. So, um, Jamie, I, I can jump in. Um, so, the as we have mentioned in the past this year, there is a new requirement to uh, for the state to report on our um, existing missions, policies, or commitments to ensure that there's equitable access access and participation in the um, activities. And um, the department's GEPA statement was submitted with our application this year, um, which there's a link there um, that will be shared with you in the chat. Um, we, you will also be required to complete the GEPA statement this year. 
um, as part of your IDEA application. Um, and we're giving you that um, state statement so that you can kind of take a look at that and use it as a template to guide um, your response to those questions, which again, will be part of the GEMS application um, and will come out in the IDEA application in um, July. I think you can go to the next one. Jamie, it looks like your internet's back. So if you wanna come back, go for it. Can you hear me, April? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, again, we're trying to just give you information ahead of time because this is new. Um, this is what you're gonna actually see on this on your application. You're gonna be required to answer these three questions as part of your application. And just wanna make sure that you know that ahead of time. Um, you'll answer the general question that was on the slide before as part of the assurances. So it may or may not you, may be you, maybe somebody else in your district that does that piece. But these three questions will be required to be answered um, as they relate to IDEA. Can you move on to the next one? April, this is you. Um, so just wanted to give a couple of updates about the IEP improvement project, specifically some of the um, changes that we've made to the website. Um, if you check out the ID, the, excuse me, the IEP improvement project website, you'll notice that we've removed some outdated materials. Um, we have posted the fillable PDF version of the IEP. Um, as you know, the last um, iteration was not fillable. So this one is fillable. It's the same content. It just allows you to go in and be able to um, utilize the different sections. Um, we've posted the translated versions of the IEP, the admin data sheet, and the invitation. Um, so those are on the website as well. And um, within the next week, we um, will be posting an updated version of the business rules for our vendors. Um, and we encourage you to um, reach out to your vendors and let them know that we have some um, an upcoming office hour session. Um, this was not a planned session, so we're excited to offer this. Um, uh, we are also encouraging you to have them send their questions to us as they um, go through the registration process and email the special ed inbox. Um, the more questions that we um, can get ahead of time, the better off we will be in um, providing you all with some supports and um, services around the transition from the, the current IEP to the new IEP. Um, and also just a reminder that we have our training of trainers symposium for schools and districts that are implementing or planning to implement in the 23-24 school year on May 31st and June 1st. Um, the timing is from 12 to three and we do expect um, teams to be present at both days. There will be different content um, happening on both days. Registration is closed at this point. Um, and we have, um, I think, I think we have over 70 um, diff different district and or school teams that have signed up at this point. So um, we're really excited for that. It's coming up. And I think that is it for this slide, Russell. I just want to underscore that we're holding that additional session for vendors. Uh, so, um, you know, just really if you could reach out to your vendors let them know that we're having this additional session for vendors to get their questions answered because we know how important their transition to the new IEP is uh, to take their IT solution and adapt it to the new form um, so we want to be responsive to questions that they might have and to follow up with anything that they need to know about from our last meeting so this will be our second meeting um, in this discussion with our with vendors in the state but we don't have a way of reaching the vendors so if you could just please let the vendors know um, that we're having this meeting um, and that they should email that email address that you see there in order to get the information so that uh, they can come to the meeting. So just want to just double down on what April said, because uh, that is work that we just need your help in reaching the vendors. And so if you could just take a minute to please um, contact them and uh, we look forward to having a, a lively discussion with them because as we um, update the business rules, really what is sometimes called the technology specifications, we want to make sure that they have that information and can ask questions about it because that that document, the, those business rules are really going to be how the vendors know to uh, to provide you the solution that you need to implement the new IEP. 
Uh, Jamie, back to you. All right, Russell, I'm going to um, move quickly through to the next slide. Um, the Special Ed Leadership Institute, just, just some information on um, the four institutes. We'll move right to the second slide. So the first one, the experienced um, leaders, that information has not come out yet. Um, as far as the registration, it'll be coming out soon, but this is information if you wanna click on the link um, about, about what that institute is. Um, for the new special ed directors and the early childhood, um, you can apply now. That's the link um, available there for uh, both of those. Um, and the last one is ETLs. Um, that is actually um, closed at this time. We added some more slots. I heard a lot from people that you wanted more slots there. Um, but that one is closed at this time. And we just have one other slide with some information on um, one of our leadership institutes and um, in case you have, have any questions. And um, Russell, just quick back, because I, I know I broke up, um, affirmations, written affirmations that gets uploaded with gems, almost everything gets uploaded with gems and the resolution funds, um, the allocations have already gone out. So you need to make sure that you have your allocations. Excellent, excellent. So we just hope we can um, drum up support and interest in the new Special Education Director Leadership Institute. Um, if you are a new director, we would love to have you participate in this institute and you can see the contact information there. Um, sometimes, you know, this has been oversubscribed. We still have openings. And so if you're in your first couple of years of special education leadership, we know there's been a, um, some turnover in the state, please consider signing up. Uh, this is really important to us, especially at this time of introducing new things like GEMS and the new IEP, um, hopefully a good time to get your, your questions answered and really to work on systems change, uh, because that's what I love that the new, that the leadership institutes are all about. Final update for today, before we turn to our panel, um, you asked, and so we are providing an update on our special ed leaders meetings for next year. You said, we kind of need the dates now, Russell. Uh, so here they are. Uh, and again, we'll send the PowerPoint around uh, in the chat so that you're able to download that. Notice what's in red there. We want to get back to doing uh, some in-person regional meetings. So we're going to uh, try to pull this off in October and April when the weather is more favorable. And we need, um, we actually need locations to come to. So, you know, we're thinking about, again, regional. So uh, at least three locations in the state, um, possibly four. But if you have a type of space that could be conducive to us hosting a meeting in, particularly we'd love it if we had tables where people could you know, you can come and be in person and meet each other and talk to each other and also talk with Desi staff who can be there in person. That's our more preferred type of setup, but we would also take a mini theater, small lecture hall, um, if that's the if that's what we can do. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, if you put into the Q&A, if you think you might be able to, to host uh, one of our meetings next year, two of our meetings next year in October and April, that will just help us finalize those dates. Uh, and you can see the times as well. Uh, so we'll come back to you about this in June again uh, to try to drum up interest in uh, coming back to in-person. But, you know, there was some of the feedback you've given us is let's get back together in person and let, let's make that connection a little deeper um, than what we can do on Zoom. So we look forward to doing that. All right. I'm going to turn it to uh, our very esteemed panel right now. And I say that with a little bit of a heaviness to my eyes because, uh, you know, I was just showing you the times. Well, we lock those into Zoom and then I send out the, I personally send out the Zoom information about Here's when Zoom sends, says this meeting is happening, but we moved the calendar invitation in Outlook to 11. So our very esteemed panelists were getting information from me as recently as this week saying the meeting was at 12. So I just want to apologize to all of them uh, for just dropping whatever they were doing and being here at 11 with us. But without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our highly esteemed colleagues. And I'm joined by my colleague, my very highly esteemed colleague, Vani Rostogi kelly in uh, supporting this panel discussion. And so Vani, as the Director of Public School Monitoring and I will sort of facilitate, but uh, Karen Robitaille is here from DPH. We have Cynthia Carbone from Holyoke, Jeannie Clancy from Springfield and Patricia Kenny from Boston. Thank you all of you for being here. We look forward to a very lively discussion. Um, I'll just, do some background with Karen, and then uh, Vani's going to pick up with the uh, the panel discussion. So really what we want to do for today is just, again, think about some of those background considerations, what's in federal, um, what can we learn federally, what can we learn uh, from statewide uh, requirements and resources, and then as soon as we can, jump into the panel. So I'm going to move quickly through um, the, the background information, but you know, where we're talking about students with health needs, 
we just want to make sure that you know this the information we present today is directional it is in informational but it's not a directive um and we want to make sure that you are really assessing what your students need in your local context and so um you know this we're not providing you know advice on exactly what to do but maybe some ideas that you could germinate on and think about what applies in your local community and just making sure that you're working uh, in that that collaborative way locally about anything that you do or change related to school health services based on what you hear today. Uh, but we hope we we kind of are enlightening and uh, eye opening around how to maybe staff a little bit differently uh, to support the needs of your children. So quick background information. We know that IDA describes uh, the difference between school health services and school nursing services. Um, and that they combined uh, can be necessary in order to provide faith. And so really appreciate your understanding that health services are part of free and appropriate public education for some students. And that um, the qualifications under IDA for, for school health personnel are described. And again, they sort of separate out this idea of a school nurse versus qualified um, other qualified school health professionals or other qualified persons. And um, there's a deeper definition that um, schools might might rely on other qualified health personnel. Uh, and so we'll sort of talk a little bit more about that as we go, how that's been sort of an interpretive and thought of uh, by our district partners. And uh, while there aren't a lot of resources federally, one that we just wanted to make sure you're aware of is uh, from OSEP's Ideas That Work resource that describes a school mentor program in Colorado. Again, this isn't, you know, it's a different state, uh, different resource, but something to maybe consider to really support, again, that staffing need around mentorship, um, I think is really important. And so here in Massachusetts, uh, Desi comes in on the licensure side. And so we know that uh, Desi has a license for school nurses, but um, let's just remember that um, that's for the person who fulfills that role of school nurse. And Karen and I are going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and a quick plug for the idea that we are, we have now proposed amendments to our uh, licensure regs uh, in several different areas that I won't read to you here, but one of them that relates to school nursing is the um, a new provisional, a new proposed provisional license for school nurses and the deadline for public comment is June 2nd, if you haven't done so already. But Karen, when we were preparing for this, we really, one of the things that you and I both wanted to impart, you and I worked together a lot over the years and I hope you'll still continue to work with me after my little mistake today. Uh, but thank you, Karen, thanks for your understanding. Um, but just this difference between um, the one person who is identified as the school nurse and then the other, um, the other nurses in the school. And Karen, you just want to elaborate on that for a minute? Sure, absolutely. And I want to say thank you for having me here today. And hello to all the special education directors and school nurse leaders that are on the call today. As the parent of a now adult child with complex health care needs, I appreciate everything that you do for children every day. And no worries, Russell, if there's anything that nurses do very, very well, it is pivot. Sorry, I had to use the, the term. All right. And I should say that I was a school nurse for many, many years and also a school nurse leader for many years um, before taking this position. So I do have um, a few different lenses that I'm able to look through, which is helpful. I think what's important to understand is that just like in a classroom, you would not think of running a fully integrated classroom of, say, 30 small children with just a licensed teacher right? You're going to have other folks helping that teacher so that the teacher can do the job that only the teacher can do under their license. You may have paraprofessionals um, that are working with just one student. You may also have a para that's in the room that's working with all students. You may have a volunteer working in that room to do some clerical duties. Similar thought process in a school health office. Every school in Massachusetts needs to have a DESI licensed school nurse. That is the manager of your school health office who is running the show. However, as you probably know, depending on the size of the school and the complexity of the students, it's becoming increasingly difficult for the nurse to do that job by themselves. And this is where the thought about 
support in the health office comes in. That might be nurses that are not DESI licensed because maybe they only have an associate degree preparation. They may be licensed practical nurses. They may be certified nursing assistants. They may be clerical staff. So that is kind of the difference that you, you do have that DESI licensed manager of the care, and then you have support staff that are working underneath that DESI licensed manager. And one of the ways where that's described uh, in, um, to maybe be a resource to you is in DPH's school health manual. And Karen, I know this is, you know, this is still current, but it's something that you're also working to update. Absolutely. We're undergoing, we've contracted out to do a major revision. It was last revised in 2007 or nine. Um, and so it is definitely due for an update. And hopefully we can talk some more about different staffing models in a newly revised version. Definitely. But one of the things that was contemplated then that we just want to build on today is that in addition to the um, the school, the school nurse, uh, this manual um, describes the role of the LPN um, in addition to the role of the school nurse. And so uh, we just wanted to quote directly from it and just you know, sort of broaden this idea, like Karen said, of the constellation of school health personnel um, that can include um, LPNs and others. Uh, but we just want to make sure that you know this is sanctioned. This is described as a model that can support um, schools and um, Karen, maybe we can see if there's any kind of questions about the role as it relates to med, uh, um, to medication administration, um, but any, any I, additional thoughts, sorry. Yes, I, I just want to say that, again, um, the scope of the LPN is described in the Nurse Practice Act, along with the scope of the RN. The difference between the two roles is in the planning of care. So an LPN cannot write a care plan, cannot write an individual health care plan. They may contribute to it. They may help someone revise it, especially if they're working very closely with the student. They may be a very valuable member of an IEP team, for example, because they have information that no one else might have. But the nurse, the school nurse, the DESI licensed school nurse, is the manager of the care and writes the plans. The LPN is responsible for implementing the plans. The LPN can also administer any medication that they feel as though they are comfortable under their nursing license to administer. The only thing they cannot do is delegate the administration of medication to non-licensed staff. So uh, this comes in, I think people are going to recognize this, <laughs> um, mostly around field trips. So you can send an LPN on a field trip. They can give all the medications. They don't, an LPN does not get delegated to by an RN. They have their own nursing license. What an LPN cannot do is delegate to teachers and other unlicensed staff the administration of medication. Only your school nurse can do that. And that's a very important distinction when you're thinking about the volume of field trips, perhaps, going out of your school, and that each one of them requires the school nurse to look it over and to do all of this delegation. Um, and it's a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. For sure. A very hot topic. So um, just uh, wanting to, to, to move to the panel, but just sort of conclude with some other considerations that there, you know, this this idea of kind of an expanded staffing model to include staff who could be, you know, health aides and assistants doing technologic, uh, technology and clerical support, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the, the work that you could just have different people doing at different times. Karen, anything that you just want to kind of plug about this last slide and then um, glad to turn Absolutely. it to the panel. Absolutely. In my experience, it's been very challenging to train, uh, recruit, and retain paraprofessionals to do personal care in particular for our more complex students. This is where a position like a certified nursing assistant might come in very handy. And a certified nursing assistant, depending on their experience, can also have other nursing tasks delegated to them by a school nurse if everyone is comfortable with that, such as 
tube feedings. So this is a way to really support your students better with their complex healthcare needs in classrooms while also taking some of the burden off of the school nurse who is trying to manage the entire building. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I think that's a great segue into our into our panel and um, I welcome our panelists to come on screen. Uh, and again, thank you for being here uh, at a moment's notice today. And uh, you all are awesome. Uh, Vani, really just want to turn it over to you with the uh, questions that you helped to prepare. Oh, great. We think, right? I see everybody on screen. Again, thank you. And thank you again for pivoting. Uh, we appreciate um, the opportunity that you were giving us today and talk to all of our um, guests and our participants. You all have very different ways in which you are successfully meeting the needs of students. And so my very first question for you, as you'll see here, is please describe the staffing solutions you've employed to meet the needs of students with disabilities in your district. And I think this is such an important question, and I want to hear from, I think we all need to hear from um, each and every one of you. So maybe if we start with Cynthia, and then we have Jeannie, and then Patricia, that would be great. So Cynthia, I'm giving you the mic right now, and then Jeannie and Patricia. Thank you so much and, and good morning, everybody. So in Holyoke, we have RN school nurses present in each school and staffing depends not just on the number of students in that building, but the acuity within that building. So three of our buildings actually have two registered school nurses um, assigned to them. Um, we also have one RN care coordination nurse, and this nurse is funded um, through the CSHS grant. So in, in Holyoke, we have high acuity, as I just mentioned, over 30% of our students are identified as having disabilities, about 90% high needs, 86% low income, uh, over 35% English uh, as a second uh, language. Um, and about 23% of our students have asthma. Um, we also have a high number of students with diabetes, seizures, life-threatening allergies, and behavioral health needs. Mm -hmm. So our nurses are doing a lot of um, hands-on work, a lot of teaching, a lot of prevention, uh, as well as family engagement, uh, working hard to support regular attendance for all of our students. So in addition to our RNs, because it's not possible for our RNs um, to accomplish all of the goals that we have set forth, our model uses licensed practical nurses, and they function as resource nurses across the district. And some of these LPNs have very specialized roles with us. Um, for example, uh, we have an LPN assigned to our transitions program, a special education program for students ages 18 to 21. So in addition to her nursing role, she also does a good deal of both individual uh, teaching and group health related and wellness education as, as well. Um, we have LPNs in our special education shine classrooms at the elementary, middle, and secondary levels. And so these LPNs are present in the classroom and they provide health-related services to those medically involved students who um, have a, a, a separate classroom. So these shine classroom nurses work very closely with the school nurse in that building, but they also collaborate with the special education teacher and the paraprofessionals within that classroom. And those classrooms have a one uh, staff member to one student ratio. Um, we do have a one to one nurses across the district, and this is based specifically on the needs of the student. Um, we currently have one one to one nurse. She's an LPN. Uh, she is an HPS employee, and she works with a medically involved child um, with a, a, a trach. So a resource and screening uh, LPN is another one of our LPNs, and this individual is responsible for supporting uh, the school nurse in completing all of the mandated screenings across the district. 
We also have a resource and response nurse, which is a newer LPN position. And this particular nurse um, helps to address our COVID-19 and other respiratory illness response. Um, we always have a nurse on call in the district for health-related questions um, for, for families or for staff, uh, even on school breaks. So this helps us be able to staff um, to do that. So our district-wide LPN resource nurses are trained specifically to our protocols and to our procedures, and they're able to work across all school buildings and all special education programs. So this helps ensure that our health services program is implemented consistently uh, and, and with fidelity. Um, they are essentially built in per diem nurses that are scheduled where the need is and they can step in on short notice, uh, something that nurses are good at doing. Uh, if the nurse is out, if um, the special education program LPN is out, they're able to just step right in because they already know the students, the families um, and the staff. So for Holyoke, this meets our needs um, with safe nursing, um, and staffing with high quality care and well-trained familiar faces are working with our students and with our families. So we've found it very effective. Great, Cynthia, I really appreciate that. Uh, and I'm gonna move to Jeannie because now you're going to hear a different model that Jeannie has set up in her district. And um, I think it's really important that we just get the flavor of everything that is happening. So thank you, Cynthia. Jeannie, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So um, Springfield's a very large district with over 23,000 students. I have over 7,684 students with special health care needs. One of the huge challenges we have is staffing. It's always been a challenge for us to find enough people to take care of everyone, but a solution to our medical needs has been to hire CNAs. We started specific to our developmental classes. <clears throat> These classrooms have medically um, challenged students, cognitively delayed, and behaviors. Paras didn't come in with a comfort level of dealing with these students, and CNAs have a training um, with basics of ADLs, with doing treatments, positioning, range of motion, utilizing gait belts and equipment. So years ago, we started working um, with hiring the CNAs, and it was a success. With that success, with staffing challenges, because our developmental classes tend to be ske scheduled or staffed with a teacher, a para, and a medical person. That medical person can now either be an LPN or a CNA based on the medical needs, which has allowed us to keep the staff rooms um, adequately staffed. Another challenge is our one-on-ones. In Springfield right now, we have 26 paras that are one-on-ones, 26 CNAs that are one-on-ones, and I have four LPNs. Three of them are SPS staff, and one of them is an agency. And what I've also done this year for two of the IEPs that have one-on-one -on -one LPNs is to work with the parents to now have the IEP say LPN or CNA. Because call outs, I can't um, easily cover. There just aren't enough nurses available. And if we have a CNA trained, the parents have agreed that they want the child in school. The RN is trained and the CNA covers when the LPN is out. Another advantage has been in a school that has four developmental classroom that say mom has also agreed when I can't staff the developmental classroom effectively that the LPN can leave the one-on-one -on -one student, put the trained CNA in so the LPN can go in the class and take care of multiple students with needs. So Cindy did a great job talking about how they staff um, Springfield. I meant Holyoke. Springfield's RN staffing, always a challenge. Um, honestly, I'm having trouble recruiting LPNs. So we're um, going with RNs in the school nurse office. That's my update. Great, thank you so much, Jeannie. I really appreciate that. And um, let me get to the second question. I may have you go first because you have a unique history of building up your program. Uh, Patricia, you have another uh, really, really alternative, excellent, successful way that you have done the staffing in your district, a very large district. So if you could share that with us, that would be fantastic. Sure, good morning, everybody. 
Um, similar to Jeannie, um, as you said, Boston is a very large district. There's over 46,000 students. Um, we have, I think there's over 30 thousand that have some significant special health care need or a disability that we have to make accommodations for on the schools. So my role as a school, uh, I'm the district nurse liaison for children with special health care needs. So I work, it's a team approach for us. It's such a big district. Um, I work with my nursing administration and the special ed team and a variety of other supports. We try to um, increase our um, relationships with other agencies to hire one-on-one -on -one nursing supports. As everybody has said, it can be an LPN as well, as long as they're comfortable with providing the nursing services that that individual student requires. They're not, in, in fact, a school nurse. They're a nurse taking care of an individual student. Um, as people have stated, staffing is a huge challenge. Um, in the past, um, I've dealt with mostly four agencies through the years. Now I've had to reach out and try to make new um, relationships with other agencies. Some of them are out of state. It's, but it's, it's still, even though we're trying to um, engage with more relationships, we still have terrible nursing shortages. It's just, uh, it is what it is. We have the number of kiddos that have more medical needs or disabilities increasing. The acuity is increasing. So in Boston, we have over, um, I think I have 49 one-on-one -on -one nurses right now. And as I said, they're both, some are LPNs, some are RNs. We do not have CNAs in Boston Public Schools. What we have is paraprofessionals who sometimes they're, um, they're assigned to a classroom to help the teacher and anything else the student needs. Others assigned as one-on-one -on -one paras to help with activities of daily living. But as Jeannie stated, they're not really trained. They don't have a medical background. So they rely on the, the school nurse and the, um, the team and the classroom to train them on the student's specific individual needs. So I love the idea of CNAs. I mean, it's great. We, it's ours as an ongoing, <laughs> um, evolving, trying to figure out what's the best way to support our students. We even have some nurses, um, some nurses in schools, we have two nurses and sometimes three in some of the large districts, large schools in the district. So I just feel like it's a challenge for everybody. We're, um, we need to take care of these kids and be welcoming, but we need to have the resources to take care of them safely. And that's a challenge for us all. So any new ideas, we're open and willing to learn and investigate new possibilities. Great. Thank you, Patricia. You're absolutely correct. There is, um, and everybody's already said it, there's a huge staffing shortage all the way around, including school nurses, which is such a critical, critical position. Um, so I'm going to move to the next question. I'll start with Jeannie and then go to Patricia and Cynthia. Um, and it just ties in with what we were talking about, right? And Jeannie, you have built up your nursing program uh, for over the many, many years. And if you could talk to us about what you have done to facilitate both recruitment and retention of nurses in your district. And I'll ask the same of Patricia and Cynthia. Okay, thank you. So in Springfield, um, I started, well, actually I didn't even know it was a recruitment. First, I was looking for help for school nurses and what a better way to help them to get student nurses in. So I have six contract with local colleges and university. So we have over a hundred students rotating through our schools every year. From there, they've become a pipeline for hiring new grads. Um, they didn't know what new nurse that school nursing offered. It is a profession. And they realize you're utilizing your skills and you really need to be comfortable with them to be in the schools. And then from there, because I know all the instructors and we're always working on getting school nurses in, they started to invite me to their recruitment fairs. So the first fair I went to, oh, I wasn't ready. Um, I didn't have a tape cloth runner and army Navy. I couldn't believe who was there. They look good. They had giveaways. So now not only do we have our tablecloth and our banner for school health, we get giveaways from HR, but I have the nurses that have graduated from those schools going to the recruitment fairs. They love it. They get to see their old instructors and they're the best people to be talking to new grads on why they should consider school nursing. So that has helped me um, increase 
school nursing. I think the other thing that I do when we're looking for nurses, I let all of my school nurses know and they post that I'm looking for nurses on their Facebook, Instagram, or whatever technology they have. Since we use a lot of CNAs, and that's a huge advantage to Springfield because they come with basic training, um, the recruitment for CNAs, what I've done, I'm lucky I have Putnam, which is a vocational high school that um, trains CNAs. We also have an internship now program or mentor program where they can actually start working with us in the school. But STIC is um, offering a CNA program. Prior to that, it was the Red Cross. I go to the class. Um, a lot of CNAs don't even know that school districts potentially could hire CNAs. So it helps to be in front of them to sell how you can work in a school. Our challenge is always um, pay because we only work in, well, in Springfield, it's 188 days. There's no way you can match um, full-time, even for school nursing. Mm -hmm. Selling points work per diem. You can match up your um, salary. It's the benefit of having all the time off the school district salary. So with all that, our recruitment process has really improved. There's still a turnover where you have to work on retention um, because as fast as you get them in, you can lose them. I think for my school nurses, the number one reason that I find nurses are leaving, it's money. You can make more working full-time in the hospital. So what I've found, if they're happy where they are, they're respected, they're well-trained, we're networking to let them know how they can maintain their annual income by working full-time in a school and per diem somewhere else. So that's um, what I've worked on for recruitment. Great. Thank you, Jeannie. I really appreciate that and appreciate the history and all the work that's gone into that. And I know Patricia and Cynthia have um, other different stories and, and different ways to uh, both recruit and retain. So Patricia, could you tell us what you've done in Boston to recruit and retain nurses in your district? Um, as I said before, it's pretty much a team approach. I don't actually go out myself to recruit nurses. I have been in several different um, colleges where they have fairs to show what school nursing, showcase what school nurses do. And the thing that I find, we have several relationships with different colleges and universities, and we uh, precept many of the nursing students in these colleges. And what's What's wonderful is it's amazing that when they come and they spend so much time at the school nurse's office, they had no idea um, the role, they had absolutely no idea, and they really see everything, maternity, pediatrics, surgery, medicine, a little bit of everything. So they really appreciate and respect the role so much more. So I think it's incumbent upon us to get out there and let them know exactly what we do. So as Jeannie said, having the students come in and see and come back, it's wonderful because they really, we've had so many students that have um, been nursing students, um, having, um, you know, learning in the school system with the nurses, come back to actually be substitute nurses and eventually full-time nurses. And you're right, salary is an issue, but, when they are happy, Jeannie, and they feel so, um, it's such a passion that you see that you do make a difference in a kiddo's life and the parents, the family, the school, it really is a calling and many of them do come back. It's just that there's so many kids with needs now that we <laughs> we just need to recruit more. And we in Boston, the administration has been trying to have different um, opportunities to um, <clears throat> acknowledge nurses and we have, monthly meetings where nurses are able to, because we have such a diverse pool of nurses, many different languages and so forth are needed in the system that they're allowed to share best practices and similarly like, strut their stuff because there's such expertise among our peers and colleagues. Sometimes we don't really know what expertise they have because they're expected to wear so many hats. So it's an opportunity for them to share their best practice and for other um, nurses to benefit from their expertise. So we all have something to bring and we are always learning. So we do the best we can, but I, I truly, as Jeannie said, if they're happy and they really see what a difference they can make in these kids' lives, it it's really makes a difference. Great, thank you, Patricia and Jeannie. I really appreciate and appreciate hearing about the passion and 
that side of it and, and the finding their calling is so important. Cynthia, could you um, provide us some additional information? Sure. So we support our LPNs um, to return to school, to become RNBSNs. And we've been very successful in retaining these nurses through that process. So we support them with their academics, their colleagues support them, and, um, and they, they've tended to stay. Um, like, um, like my colleagues, we are also a site for uh, a clinical nursing site for area colleges and UMass Amherst and Holyoke Community College um, regularly places students with us um, literally from September through May. And we've found that we have many applicants for our positions um, from the nurses being and uh, being in our district and, and seeing close up. Um, what school nursing looks like. Word of mouth has has been um, tremendous for us because when when nurses are respected and and when they're compensated for their work, they tend to recommend their friends and relatives when positions come up. And several um, of our team members have joined us um, in this manner. Um, we are very thoughtful about the working conditions of our nurses. And I cannot overstate how hard our nurses, all nurses have worked through the pandemic. Um, so I think when a district can be known for having clear policies and procedures in place and following best practice, then you're going to attract the kind of candidates that you want to your district. Um, and so in, in my experience, nurses like structure, they like clear roles, um, they like clear expectations. And so um, I think it's important to make sure that we have that in our districts to attract and, and maintain um, our nurses. We've been offering bonuses, which um, um, both of my colleagues have spoken to that the in terms of compensation, I think that's probably um, the most um, significant barrier to um, to hiring and keeping uh, our, our staff. Um, so we have been able to offer bonuses and it's something that our district has um, stepped up and done this year with nursing and, and other uh, staff members. We do a, a great deal with recognition and incentives in building our nursing team. Um, for example, we provided lab coats for all of our nurses and they were embroidered with their names and our motto, which is healthy students learn better. And it seems very simple and very functional, but it really meant a lot to the team. And so these types of um, incentives and recognitions happen regularly, not just on school nurse day or, or nurse week, but literally it's something that we're mindful of throughout the, the year. I think it's also really important to provide specific praise and opportunities for each nurse to shine. Um, our nurses within district have a part in writing and editing every form, procedure, and protocol that we have. Um, when, a nursing, when a nurse does something caring and kind towards another nurse, I'm very quick to call that out. Um, and it's a culture that's been developed over time that's very positive and collegial. Um, we've created health offices where the school nurse is the health-related building expert. So um, this is a place of, of calm and competence. So no matter what is whirling on outside of the health office, um, they are in charge of what happens within their health office, and they are the recognized um, health expert in, the, in their building. You know, I just wanted to, to end by saying that there are a lot of options and opportunities um, for nurses out there right now, and it's very challenging to build a cohesive staff. Um, I think recognizing excellence and um, valuing the work that they do regularly goes a long way um, towards keeping them. Um, we do play up the benefits of not um, working weekends uh, or evenings. Um, if the after, as a nurse, a floor nurse, if an afternoon shift doesn't show up, there's a requirement to stay. And so our nurses don't have to do that. But we do offer them um, summer 
the schoolwork, which many of our nurses take advantage of and they're well compensated for that. We also have before and after school programs where our nurses can come early or stay late and they pick up extra money for that. Um, but the majority of our nurses, like our colleagues, my colleagues have mentioned, um, work another per diem job. And they do that because their heart is in school nursing. And we hire people who believe in what they're doing and believe that they're making a difference um, with the care that they're offering um, the students. So um, I think playing up those benefits of the position have helped us to attract people and then by the other incentives and of valuing the employees, um, we're able to keep them. Great, thank you so much, Cynthia. I appreciate hearing from all of you on that particular question. And we have one more question, and um, I know it's a broad question, but I'm hoping we can just go a little quick, um, one minute from each of you, and wrap up maybe a couple minutes early to bring Russell back on. But Patricia, if I could start with you, what advice would you give to special education and school health leaders in supporting students with a wide range of disabilities? I think that the most important thing is communication, work as a team, Every discipline has their um, their goals, but the bottom line is we're all there for the student. And I think everybody working together to achieve that goal is critical. So being part of the special ed team, all the meetings that go on um, within each school, each school is different. So you have to know all the um, stakeholders in the school that all have an impact on children. So it could be a variety of different teams and disciplines within that school, but I think the nurse is an integral part and to meet our children's wide diverse needs, we all have to work as a, as a whole team using the team approach and not be afraid to ask questions, not being afraid to ask for help. We all have our different expertises and I just think it's critical that we all work together. Basic Great. communication. Great, thank you, Patricia. And Cynthia, the same for you. I know the questions came off the screen, but um, if you have that, otherwise I'm happy to read it back out to you. I think there's there's two things that that come to mind. Um, the first is don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, work with other districts and become partners with them. Reach out when you need help, but also be very generous in sharing the successes that you have had. And then the second thing that I would say is that rely on the expertise of your director of nursing and support that person to develop a strong team of nurses and trust them when they advise you. Thank you, Cynthia. And Jeannie, final last question. Okay, so um, everybody mentioned what I was gonna say, which um, basically is you gotta be a part of the team. They're right. The nurse leader um, can be the expert. My school nurses are experts too. And clearly reach out to others and don't reinvent the wheel. We are constantly emailing, oh, Boston, Worcester, even Cindy and Holyoke, if I need a policy or have a question with what's going on. Um, but I just want to say thank you to Springfield's team. I couldn't do my job without them. <laughs> thank you. And I think if I can just jump in, it's really important for special education uh, directors and leaders to, to know that school health staff in Massachusetts are considered um, nationally to be the best and that we have a very strong system of networking and professional development that exists. And if you wanna know more about that, please ask the nurses in your district there's a lot of support for your nursing staff out there, including my unit, um, and they should feel free to reach out to us anytime. And at the, the end of the day, there's one medical expert in your building. Please utilize them. Very, very well said, and, and thank you all of you. This was um, so informational and provoking uh, and really kind of open our eyes to just other ways of can you know approaching school health services really maintaining a high degree of professionalism and a high degree of support is really a key takeaway for me from what I heard today um, so I just really appreciate this and just also want to acknowledge um, all the great people who just joined us today and thank you for your input in the the Q&A um, maybe just one quick thing about the Q&A as we look ahead um, some questions about you know what's coming this summer it's really why we've maintained summer meetings in August. 
um, and uh, so that we can bring you new information, particularly about the IEP um, as we uh, kind of get ready to ramp up for the new school year. So I look forward to getting back together with you, obviously in June, come back next month, and we'll make sure we get the time right. And then uh, in August as well. But really just want to conclude by uh, sending sincere appreciation to Vani, our panelists, to Karen. Uh, thank you all so much. And I um, just really appreciate you being here today. Um, really supports kids. That's what we're all in for. So thank you. Take good care.